Ministry of Future Affairs is a series of peer-to-peer -peer interviews organized by Armenia 2041 Foundation and conducted by well-known Armenians and non-Armenians from around the world. The series covers a wide range of topics, including science, education, healthcare, politics, business, and focuses on themes relevant to Armenia and the diaspora. Watch every week on Armenia 2041 and CivilNet platforms. So welcome everyone. Uh, the Ministry of Future Affairs program consists of a series of peer-to-peer -peer interviews to gather perspectives from around the globe on science, business, economics, culture, education, healthcare, so that we can share all that with the global Armenian nation. It's an initiative that we've launched recently to help bring awareness to various topics and enable sustainable and secure development of Armenia as a country and Armenians as a global nation. It's my pleasure today to be talking to Ardem Patapudian, who is a Lebanese-born Armenian-American. He's a professor in the Doris Neuroscience Center at Scripps Research and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. He's a Nobel laureate and received this recognition for his work in physiology and medicine for groundbreaking research that solved a long-standing mystery of how the body senses touch and other mechanical stimuli. Welcome, Ardem. Let's start out going back to your, your birthplace, Beirut, Lebanon, something that we share. Uh, you're born there, you, were, you attended Armenian schools before enrolling at the American University of Beirut and subsequently transferred to the US and I've been living here since. Can you tell us how your upbringing as an Armenian in Beirut and later as an immigrant in the US has impacted your career choices and your worldview? Being Armenian and growing up in Lebanon, both Armenian community and Lebanese highly value education. And I really experienced that as a, as a child growing up. My parents, my, my mom was actually a teacher and a principal of an Armenian school. It was an AGBU school, actually. And so education was very important. And I remember my mom spending long hours with me. Uh, in the afternoons, making sure I was learning properly and, and doing all my homework, uh, something I have not done with my own son. But I think that that had a huge impact on me. And uh, coming here after one year of uh, American University of Beirut and enrolling at UCLA, I remember being shocked that it was not very difficult for me. It was not a very a big jump so uh, you know it means that my education was in firm ground so that was that was a very important aspect um, i got into doing science totally by accident so i don't know how much being an in immigrant or armenian impacted that but i can say now that i'm in it and i've practiced it i think um, having this immigrant mentality of you know, looking at things from a very different culture that we're from. So looking at science with a very different point of view uh, is really, really important. You know, there's a lot of scientists studying the same questions. And if you come from a different field, you look at it differently. You look at it with a fresh eye. And I think there's parallels to why immigrants have done so well in the United States who, who come here with that different perspective. And we talk about diversity as well, as if that's kind of a uh, something to be given away to allow. I think it's beneficial to any field of study, and especially science, to have people that come from very different backgrounds who think differently, who approach questions differently. And I think my immigrant background has had a huge impact on it. You hinted at a, an unusual way by which you came about science. Maybe you can share with us how how you got interested in science and importantly, when you realized that you would be a career scientist. So the one thing that was lacking in Lebanon was tradition of training scientists and practicing scientists. So I didn't know any scientists there. I didn't know that that was a career that one could pursue. So when I came to UCLA, I was a pre-med student trying to go to medical school, obviously. And um, I quickly realized that, you know, at UCLA class sizes are somewhere from 100 to 400 students per class. So it was very hard to get to know professors and to get letters of recommendations, which are so important to get into medical school. Uh, 
And then I had the, you know, brilliant idea that, oh, why don't I work in a lab just so that I can know a professor and they can write me a good letter. So it was a completely self-serving for a different purpose kind of thing that I tried to get into a lab, which was not easy at that time. There was no email kind of placing ourselves with age here. But, uh, and uh, I remember calling 20 professors and um, none of them wanted to deal with a undergraduate who had no experience in a laboratory. Finally, the last person who was also Judy Laniel was going to say no, just before hanging up, asked me, what was your GPA again? Uh, so it was, it was, it was good, but not, you know, uh, perfect. It was 3.7, I think. And she's like, why don't you come talk to me tomorrow? And that was the beginning. Cause once I start working in a lab, I just realized how much I absolutely love the discovery process of, uh, of, of all this you know, how our bodies work that we just don't understand. And you come into lab with ideas and test it. It's, um, so it was wonderful. And I immediately fell in love with it. And it took me a few months, but realized that um, this is what I should be doing and kind of shifted approach mm -hmm. and went to the PhD route instead of going to medical school. And, and there's a common kind of commonality in the way many people do science uh, and a kind of a scientific mindset and an approach how did you or when did you pick that up was it purely while you were doing experiments or did you at some point start kind of thinking through how science should be done could be done uh, and then begin to incorporate it i think it um, slowly kind of processed it while being in science i think uh, unlike any other profession that i know that um, education like in a classroom, that's how it starts. I always feel like the, the work of a scientist in a laboratory, there's no manual of how to become a scientist. So you kind of have to put in the hours and slowly learn and look at examples of how things work, try to make generalizations, learn from it and move on. One of the ways we mm -hmm. um, exchange ideas, every laboratory, science, biology laboratory does this is group meetings. And you know, when you go to um, a college for a course, there are requirements. You take biology 101, and then you take more advanced biology. Here, you kind of are thrown in uh, where postdocs and graduate students who've had five to 10 years of experience in how science is done, talk about the work. And so initially, you don't understand anything. You hardly know what's going on or why they're doing what. And I think it's this ability to try to pick up small lessons and getting generalizations from them is, is is a key fact but i some people don't like this because they're not they don't feel comfortable with uncertainty of not knowing i think that's mm -hmm. one thing about me that i don't have any problems with saying i don't understand this at all or uh, but mm -hmm. that doesn't scare me or take me away from it on the contrary mm -hmm. You know, whatever interests you, you dive in and and try to learn but there's no textbook to yeah. how to become a scientist as i said it's just a it's a process that you have to be patient with yeah yeah and of course what you just described also fits the immigrant mindset because immigrants usually arrive and they're not supposed to know something and so they have an easier time asking than if you're supposed to be born with that type of uh, endowed knowledge that now you have to admit isn't perfect so that's that's a good connection. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, you know, most Armenians, uh, and for that matter, probably most people in the world, uh, learned about you and your work uh, with the announcement of the no Nobel Prize, uh, for which we all congratulate you. But if you look back at the work that you did, that that you feel earned you that recognition, you know, just to get the audience to understand the the long term nature of this, but also the the spikes in, in, in advance that happened. Was there ever an aha moment where you kind of realized the, the, that, that you had made a discovery of, of, of such consequence and such importance? Yeah, I, I think back about this now. And um, of course, it was never the, the goal to win a Nobel Prize. I, I don't think scientists, um, at least they shouldn't do the work for any prizes, but for the for the process of discovery. Um, I mean, we knew we were looking for something that was 
very important in the sense that it was a major unknown that wasn't that was a lot of people were curious about for decades but hadn't hadn't been able to crack it in a ways and so we we knew that it was it was an important question we're asking that there's no doubt about it um and the experiment that we did the initial experiment with my postdoctoral fellow from france again very international flavor bertrand cost was uh we used a very, very reductionist approach to ask these questions. We thought a lot about how to do this. And once we decided how we we're going to approach it, um, Bertrand had to work on this experimentally in the laboratory for a whole year. Um, we didn't know how long it was going to take to find this one molecule that we were looking for. And so one has to imagine what it is for him and for me trying to support him and work with him a whole year of not getting any positive results. So you make a decision, this is how we're going to work. And then for a whole year, you just get negative results day after day. And you have to stay motivated to keep asking the same question you were asking. And finally, at the end of the year, he, he, he got a result that clearly showed that he had found what he was looking for. So that's as close as an aha moment as I can imagine one would have. And uh, so we were very, very excited. But as in many things in, in science, um, that aha moment was important, but it took years and years afterwards, more and more research to appreciate how important the discovery was. So it was partly clear from that moment, but it took years to kind of solidify that thinking that this was something important. Ardem, in, in your description, you, you mentioned that nobody does this kind of science to win awards and recognitions and the like. But obviously, you were in a field where people do get recognized very, very rarely, uh, of, of such, of, of, especially with such magnitude of recognition. I'm sure you've been asked this question a hundred times, but for the hundred and first time to an Armenian audience, how did it feel when you, when you got the news? Um, it's a... It's, it's a roller coaster. I mean, the first thing people have to realize is that it happens if you live in the West Coast, 2.20 in the morning. So you're not very coherent. <laughs> and in my case, I actually had my phone on um, do not disturb. So I did not get three phone calls from Stockholm that morning. Uh, interestingly, they got a hold of my father, uh, Sarkis, who lives in Los Angeles area. He is 95 years old almost, and uh, uh, but he he answered the phone. He the the head of the committee actually told me that he was my dad was not very happy to be so someone was calling him at 2 a.m. So he was kind of yelling at him a little bit. <laughs> um, but then finally, I think he understood what was going on, and uh, he called me, which he could overcome the do not disturb message. And then when I checked my phone with the you know, missed calls, I realized what was going on. Uh, but you have very little time to kind of think about what this means or what's going to happen because you get immediately inundated by so many media calls and a press conference. Yeah. And you got to realize that unlike um, many people, you know, we go from being a, just being in a lab, not really... Uh, used to this kind of attention it's all of a sudden it's two in the morning so you don't have too much time to process and i hadn't talked to that many media people so it's a it's a shock to the system um but as you as the days and the weeks and the months go by you start realizing what a what an incredible privilege it is to 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 get such recognition and um i've said this before it's one of the greatest joys is to see other people rejoice in it. And so I have to say the whole um, Armenian nation, the kind of response I've gotten it is, is one of the highlights because uh, the, how they've embraced this as their own is, is causes me great joy. Well, it's funny you described a little bit ago how you and your postdoc, French postdoc, spent a year discovering a protein and, and in a similar way, the world discovered your work. Um, so if the protein had feeling, maybe it would have felt like it won a Nobel Prize. 
by being discovered at the same moment because that's how the protein became known too is through your work so yes. that's great let me just kind of stick especially now that you mentioned your father to that theme and and i kind of expand a bit on april 24th you tweeted that you were thinking of your ancestors who perished and those who survived and started a new life in lebanon what does being a descendant of armenian genocide survivors mean to you what kind of responsibility does that legacy entail how does it affect your life it's a it's a very complicated topic um a very important one obviously and i don't know of any armenian who the the genocide doesn't play a huge part of their being because we you know we grow up uh, armenians born in lebanon already from the get-go you, you know you know that that's direct consequence of the of the genocide and so and i think armenians are so passionate about this for a good reason i i went through different phases in my life i was very dedicated uh, to this cause and it was a big part of my life and then for a while i kind of um kind of took a step back because i didn't want this to define me or our nation right i just didn't want the genocide to be the the thing you know about armenians i i think i wanted us to move on and uh, do other great things and um and and be known for for those kind of things um at the same time now especially after the recognition i kind of hinted at it uh being an immigrant being an armenian is part of my story and i certainly again embrace it and most importantly is how we learn from this, how we go forward. What do we do with this information? Um, one of the things of being a scientist is, um, we mentioned my, my postdoc was French. I have this um, image that I show in my seminars, putting a pin on all the birthplaces of every member of my lab was born in. And if I showed that to you, they would be from all over the world. And so science is the ultimate, I think, example of people from around the world can come together to do good. And this humanistic kind of internationalism, I really embrace as well. I love to think of myself mm. as human first. And, um, and that's not anti-nationalism, but it's kind of, uh, it kind of, puts it in perspective. So I, um, so again, I, I, I told you it's gonna be complicated answer. I feel very passionate about being Armenian. I'm very proud of being Armenian. I think it's a tragedy how we still discuss today about the genocide not even being accepted by everyone. Um, and we need to learn from it. At the same time, I feel like you can have a healthy dose of nationalist, nationalism at the same time. Um, feel like we're all humans and we should all work together for, uh, as the Nobel committee says, for the better of humanity. Mm, that's great. That's excellent. Um, also, speaking of your father, I know that he composes poems. He's an accomplished writer. What do you like to do other than working on science um, that, that kind of enriches your life? Beyond the science, um, what other I, interests do you have? Yes. Absolutely. I, um, I, I love the arts as well. I don't write like my father does, but I, um, um, I play a little bit of trumpet, but I love music of all kinds, um, jazz, classical, rock. Um, so I attend lots of cultural events. I also love the outdoors. That's my number one passion, I would say, uh, whether it's hiking, backpacking, uh, swimming in the ocean here in La Jolla. Um, I, not only because I really, really enjoy it, it's, I've often said that while being outdoors is when my best ideas in science come uh, to me. And so I know the question was not about science, but I feel like my life is uh, uh, very connected. It's, uh, I can't separate them actually very much. Um, but um, yeah, I love to travel, which, you know, being a scientist is a wonderful way to travel a lot, especially with this recognition. I have lots of invitations from very interesting places in the world. Um, so yeah, I think that being a scientist, especially later, um, you know, you don't have to be in the laboratory 18 hours a day to 
to to make the discoveries. It's mainly about thinking, thinking the right way, and you can think while doing anything else. That's the that's the best part about it. Super. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to uh, pry from you another kind of a uh, a simple question, but maybe with a with a complicated or or, or difficult answer. Um, so there's going to be a lot of young folks who listen to this, and you're an inspiration to young and old, but particularly those who are thinking about a career trajectory. And I'm sure some of them are are wondering, as I would have, as you would have, if you listened to this, uh, how it is that you decide what to work on. So obviously, you know, you were drawn to a particular set of problems, but you know, you you you've made decisions of what to work on, what to work on next, what interests you. How do you do that? I would say that's the best part about doing basic science because uh, you have that complete freedom. You wake up one day and say, you know, how fibrosis in liver happens is not known. I'm going to study that. And you can. That's the beauty of science is that you have to find what interests you, what is an open question that you can tackle and you can study it. Um, of course, you got to find funding. There are details we don't need to talk about. Um, but so to me, how I make the decision is uh, it always starts with observation. I don't think it's an intellectual process first, ob observing what we understand and what we don't understand. And then deciding which of these questions have a practical probability to solve it in the next five to 10 years. So it's kind of that intersection between what is unknown and what's doable. So if, let's say if I said, I want to understand how consciousness works, um, that's a wonderful question. One of the most important things for a human in neuroscience, but do we have practically the, the tools in a laboratory to be able to answer that in the next five, 10 years? And if the answer is no, maybe one needs to find a different question. So the, the process for me is again, very simple, but what I want to mainly emphasize is what I said first, which is this, this awe, amazement I have of how does our body work and the answers that we don't know to it and that we can do experiments to find out is the most amazing pleasure one can get out of it. And, and that's what I love doing science. Yeah. And, and a related question, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep my questions limited now because I want to make sure we get, we get through the whole list, but um, I mean, it, it's hard to work in biology or fundamental biology without facing the the kind of underlying process that created all this complexity, which is evolution, Darwinian evolution. How have you interacted with the concept of evolution in your scientific life? And and I mean by that in all the difficult, like when you look at what do we know, what we don't know, a lot of what we don't know, we don't know because it's really hard to figure out what evolution has produced. Uh, it, how important is that in your work? I think um, evolution is a lens that we need to use for all questions related to biology, because unlike uh, computer chips where you can design something and build it, everything that we experience and see around us has gone through evolution this whole uh, you know millennia. And um, I'll just give you an example. The protein that we talked about that we identified called piezo are these mechanosensors. They, they sit in a outside of the cell lipid membrane and that sense membrane tension. So one of the things that is very unique about them is they're one of the largest of this class of proteins called ion channels. And if you look through evolution, the same protein is very, very large from unicellular organisms all the way to humans. And so the first thing you ask yourself is, why is it so large? I get this question all the time. And I always answer it from evolutionary perspective because it takes a lot of energy to make a very large protein. If this large size was not required, evolution would have had time and reason to cut it down and have a smaller version that works just as well. The fact that it's not, tells me that it's part of its importance. So here's a question then you can start answering from the lens of observing it through the eyes of evolution. Now, in addition to being a scientist and many other things, you're also a teacher and you've trained uh, a lot of PhDs and postdocs over time. Uh, are there two or three 
special insights that you like to impart to your trainees uh, in addition to in addition to exposing them to some of the deep questions in in biology uh, what are they one of, so I, I say this often now is that I'm, I'm painting a very rosy picture of science, which I, I believe it is, but it also can be very frustrating. And I think this applies not just to scientists, probably everyone in any profession. We already talked about uh, Bertrand spending a whole year not getting any positive result. You can imagine how frustrating it is. I hinted at this, but didn't talk about it. Securing funding to do your research can be a very frustrating process. And so many scientists experience this. Um, and what I see in trainees a lot of times is this frustrations, um, although they're very real, taking over their kind of day-to-day -day existence. So the whole thing becomes a frustrating experience. And I like to just remind people the, the joy of doing science, of why they got into it to begin with, which is again what we talked about, is you come in every day to lab thinking of a new question that you ask and maybe some days you'll get an answer that no one else ever knew in the history of humankind. I mean, that's a very special thing. So I think focusing on positives, uh, being an optimist and reminding you of why you got into this line of work in the first place are great ways to keep the frustrations at bay and 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 focus again on what really matters which is doing science you love it that's why you did it and again i think this is not just for 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 science but many many people in different careers experience the same emotions and i, and I want to kind of conclude by taking a, a kind of an imaginary flight to our homeland uh, in Armenia, for that matter, the diaspora in the Middle East, and Armenians in general. And obviously, um, you know, you now have a life of experiences and, and, and exposure to lots of different mindsets and ways of living and, and, and what, what represents uh, kind of uh, Western mindsets, but also other Eastern mindsets. If you integrate all that and you look at where we are in our development as a nation, um, how, what kind of, kind of uh, hopes and, 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 and dreams do you have for the Armenian nation? I mean, we're obviously at a moment where our safety and security is somewhat challenged. Uh, there's serious economic challenges. You know, it's, it's, it's frustrating on that front. The question is in your mind as you increasingly kind of are seeing the world you know in a, in a different perspective what kind of ideas top of mind thoughts do you have that could be that could be useful for your compatriots to hear obviously we know that uh, you know Armenians throughout history have been very talented very hardworking and I think this is something to be very proud of and also to to cultivate so both you and I are you know, huge, huge supporters of education. And I think, you know, looking at Armenia or any other developing or developed country, uh, I would say the same thing about United States is encouraging education is one of the most important ways for solving many of the problems that um, the world and also Armenia faces. So education, 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 I would say is the, the highest priority as far as I'm concerned. And I'm, and I'm happy to do anything I can to, to get that message across. And uh, when one comes more into individual um, decisions, if I look back in my career, um, I feel like it's just so important for me to have found a career that I'm good at, but at the same time, I love to do and have a passion for. Um, I often said this too, that um, if I was financially well off and um, nobody paid me, I would still do what I'm doing now. What a privilege to be able to say that. And I think if everybody, and I believe that everybody has a passion like this, it might not be science. Um, and to strive for that is one of the best ways you can not just make, give yourself a content, happy life, but help your community the most. Because if you're, if you're working on something with a passion, chances are, uh, you're going to help your community much more than if you look at job as a as something you have to do and you're unhappy with. And so, uh, my my advice to to kids is explore. And I look at my past, 
and see how I stumbled into this laboratory research without knowing that I would love it so much. And uh, I guess the key to that is try to experience as many things as you can while you're doing your education and, and, and again, find your passion. Yeah, super. No, I think, I think it's a great takeaway and I'll just add to that the desire to be the best you can be at something, but also the, the best in the world if the opportunity is given and not settle for good enough. I mean, that's what you've done through your uh, career. And, and I think there's many, many examples. And I think those examples can also remind, you know, kind of all of our nation that there's really no reason to assume that that's not possible for us, but it's possible for some other people. At the end of the day, in any chosen field, it's, you know, it's the hard work, it's the accepting frustration and disappointment all along the way and a lot of you know fortunate breaks along the way and 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 really aspiring uh to to greatness in every single activity so listen it's great to chat thanks for doing this interview and uh, look forward to meeting in person soon it was a pleasure thank you thank you Arden.